know, I'll touch on this in the upcoming slides. This, this slide has a lot of information, but ultimately, if you're considering um, adding another aspect to either your air or ground-based surveys, that aspect you may consider adding is gas detection. And you've got a number of options in terms of how you would do gas detection. Uh, people have used um, high energy backscatter systems, photo ionization, flame ionization. Lasers, themse lasers uh, themselves have developed a, a very large base, over 50 systems. And the reason they have is their response, their sensitivity, their robustness, uh, their repeatability. In other words, this is a highly sensitive and very reliable platform to add uh, an extra facet to a service that a company that uh, uses um, helicopters uh, can provide to clients. So robust, high performance, repeatable, uh, consistent performance that allows uh, you to be new. So in addition to maybe high definition video, uh, forward looking infrared, lasers uh, complement and add to that by seeing gas uh, very quickly and reliably. And this is part of our tie-in with Red End as well, and we'll touch on that soon. Uh, next slide. So how does a laser work? How is this technology different or better than other systems? Why would you, in other words, uh, consider a laser system over other technologies? Lasers see gas by interacting with the molecule uh, of interest. In this case, uh, and for mobile leak detection applications, it's typically, not always, but typically methane. So the laser will look at an area in the near infrared where the gas of interest absorbs energy. That laser is tunable. So it focuses on a very narrow area where the gas of interest absorbs energy. If the laser interacts with that gas, we see that interaction. The important thing with this is we're not affected by other gases. We're not affected by humidity. We're not affected by rapid temperature changes, uh, cold weather, um, dust. Uh, mist. It's it's a non-issue for lasers. They just simply see methane or whatever gas they're attuned to look at uh, very quickly, reliably, and unambiguously. This translates into reliable, um, certain leak detection. Next slide. This just um, extrapolates on the last slide. Essentially. Um, the laser itself will send out uh, a certain frequency. We interact with the gas in question. We will um, send out a, a 10 megahertz signal. We'll um, get back a, that signal and a harmonic of the signal. And the differential between uh, the two signals gives us uh, leak detection. It's sort of a four inch slide. It's the physics behind it. What it translates into is that if we see something, it's not um, it's not a false positive. It's the actual uh, elevated gas level of interest, which means you're certain of an event. Next slide. So some of the applications we use, I I put down um, some of the fixed leak detection applications, and this can be complementary uh, to mobile leak detection, for example. Uh, east to west and methane leak detection around gas processing uh, and production, aerial cooler monitoring, uh, CO2 monitoring and sequestration facilities. We do a lot of work with uh, hydrogen fluoride, ammonia, um, and other uh, fixed applications. Uh, portable systems, we can either mount these to uh, um, airframes, Bell uh, 206s, um, A Stars, Robinson R44s, and some other airframes. Most of the work we do. Uh, for uh, airborne systems is for methane. We do ground-based surveys for uh, methane, CO2. We can do other gases such as ammonia and acid plus as well. Next slide. This is an illustration of how mobile leak detection works uh, in conjunction with uh, um, the Red Hen platform. Uh, 
the great thing with the Red Hand platform is it's able to multiplex various techniques for um, visual, uh, infrared, um, laser-based gas sensing and multiplex that information into a very feature-rich deliverable. The laser itself, uh, you can see the probe on the uh, base of that helicopter. Uh, the helicopter will fly along the pipeline and through the plume, and we will sense those molecules and tell very quickly that um, there's been uh, or there is an event, and then that can be corroborated by other techniques and, and doing uh, a couple of circles of the area uh, of interest. Next slide. This is uh, a, an example of one of our installations. As I mentioned, we've got almost 50 airborne installations flying around the world. Uh, it's very compact, as you can see. Uh, the laser, the power supply, uh, a visible um, and an alarm module that's visible to the pilot. Uh, the important thing, too, with the Boreal system is it's not absolutely necessary, although many like to do this, to have uh, a co-operator uh, with the laser system. Now, you would need a co-operator if you're using uh, other techniques as well, but the laser system can be flown uh, solo uh, as, as a standalone thing. Uh, next slide. This is a tearaway. This is what the cell looks like. Um, there's a, uh, a laser path in there. This path bounces back and forth a couple of times, increasing our uh, sensitivity to methane. Uh, this is in a uh, stainless steel housing and then surrounded by a shroud that protects it from dust and bugs and, and to a certain degree, uh, uh, rain infiltration. Next slide. A schematic. Uh, this is, you saw a slide a couple of uh, a couple ago where we uh, showed this equipment installed in a helicopter. This is what it looks like schematically. Uh, next slide. Okay. So thanks, John. Um, that's kind of the the basis of the uh, of the boreal itself and the and the schematic and and how it's connected. And most importantly, John covered the science of how the laser works and how it detects methane gas. What I'm going to go through is <clears throat> how we use our Red Hen hardware and software to maximize um, the effectiveness of your Boreal because the Boreal, it's going to pick up those PPM levels down to 0.2 PPM. You're going to be able to establish an ambient uh, level of methane and then it's going to tell you whenever you have emissions areas that are above that ambient level. So what this slide is, is this is a uh, picture of our uh, VMS 333 and the VMS 333 is Red Hen Systems uh, patented proprietary hardware product and what the what the VMS 333 does is it's a data multiplexer it takes <clears throat> several streams of data most importantly uh, the GPS coordinates and it embeds that those coordinates with any other data that's taken into your color video and or your IR video and so when we when uh, we, meaning Red Hen Systems, when we fly these pipelines, what we're doing is we're taking the, the data from the Boreal and we're taking uh, wind speed direction, we're taking temperature, humidity, we're taking the GPS coordinates, and we're embedding that data into our color video and into our IR video as we fly through the corridor or as we drive. And I'll show you an example of driving here in a little bit. Um, so just really quickly, um, you, you saw Bog holding a FLIR camera in the helicopter. This is a, a picture of the FLIR camera that we use. We use an SC6788. Um, the, the important thing here is the, the resolution is uh, 640 by 512, so it's a high resolution uh, IR camera. Um, any uh, IR camera will do. We, we like this particular FLIR because of the resolution and because it's a mid-wave mid infrared uh, camera which is set up for optical gas imaging and, and that's what it's optimized for is to see those plumes so that when your Boreal picks up those higher emissions levels, higher emission levels, then you can circle back and you can uh, try to find that plume with your IR camera. 
Um, this is basically a flow chart of the, the data that flows into the VMS and then the data that flows out of the VMS. And so it's sort of a 30,000 foot view of how the VMS works. As you can see here, we've got our Boreal laser in that schematic configuration that, that John showed you a couple of slides ago. And we've got that data feeding into the VMS as well as the GPS from our, our Garmin puck here. Uh, the more accurate your GPS source is, the more accurate the GPS locations will be on your, on your geotag video. And then we've got atmospheric data. We've got an anemometer here, so we're taking wind speed and direction. And then uh, we also have a temperature humidity gauge, and that'll feed into our VMS as well. And then what the VMS is doing is it is uh, in these uh, these video cameras that have audio channels is it's, uh, it's feeding that data into the video and it's embedding that data into the video on these, uh, on these color videos. And then, um, and then we also have a way to embed that data into the IR video. So here we've got three cameras and what we're doing with the VMS is we're synchronizing our data so that you have three different uh, you have two different color video angles, and you have another uh, infrared uh, video angle. But on all three of these videos, your GPS coordinates have been synchronized by the VMS because it's feeding these data streams into this uh, video stream uh, simultaneously. So it's, it's very nicely uh, synchronized for when you go back to reference that later. Um, so again, there's some software involved. Gasware is your, is your real-time data collection and report. So it's going to tell you the PPM levels at each point along the, uh, along the track log. And I'm going to show you how Gasware works here in a, in a minute. Um, and then we have uh, Gas Analyst. That is our post-process software. And that takes into consideration those factors like wind speed, direction, temperature, humidity. And it takes those factors into consideration to, t to try to tell you, um, or, or I should say to tell you where the origin of the emission is. So it helps you locate, you know, I would say within four or five feet of where the exact emission is coming from that you're looking at on your Boreal. Um, and then we, we back up the data and hold that in a secure location. Again, this is another angle uh, this picture is here of you know a slide that John went over earlier and um, basically here you have a, a helicopter flying through the gas plume um, flying in the corridor and so it's it's uh, you know the boreal is is uh, stating that the the ppm levels are, are higher than normal and then what we're doing is we're we're factoring in these these uh, atmospheric uh, this atmospheric data set to try to locate where this plume is coming from. So this is just a, a couple of different platforms um, as far as you know how you can use the Boreal, where you can use it. You know, here we've got the obvious one, the helicopter. Um, this is a bumper-mounted uh, setup for the Boreal, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just have John kind of explain where the you know, where the bumper mounted application works the best. Uh, John, what what was your uh, your answer for that? We, uh, we have a couple of different ways of deploying mobile uh, methane or gas monitoring systems, if you will, where there are uh, distribution systems in cities, for example, we prefer to mount on the front bumper close to the uh, leak source. This is because these leaks are relatively low pressure and relatively small, so you've got a better chance of seeing them if you're um, if you're mounted to the bumper of, uh, of a vehicle. If uh, these leaks are in rural areas, um, along pipelines, or looking for releases from batteries or uh, line heaters um, or uh, well batteries then it really doesn't matter. Um, you can have it mounted on the bumper of the roof, but the transition uh, for rural areas is lower down out 
can become a hindrance because it can be uh, uh, struck by objects or get muddy. So for urban leak inspections, um, the bumper makes a lot of sense. For rural work, um, the roof makes a lot of sense. Excellent. So here's another picture of the helicopter. We've just got some things labeled here. But here's the, the one I wanted to show you to go with what John's saying. So here we had the Boreal mounted to the, the top of the vehicle um, because we were looking in more of the rural areas and we were more uh, interested in this case. Um, our use case was sort of trying to find uh, emissions from tank batteries and so the release is higher in that case and so for this one we mounted the Boreal to the top of the vehicle. Uh, this is another UTV application here in the bottom left hand corner uh, where it's just mounted here to the, the, the front uh, upper side of the UTV and this is again the mud the mud uh, issue that, that John was talking about. We want to mount that a little higher so we don't get that cover um, muddy. So uh, Red Hen Systems, Boreal, we both companies we have friendly knowledgeable um, staffs in place to uh, help you set up your equipment and maximize your equipment and then manage your data process. Um, we, we assist you with that. We don't just uh, sell you the equipment and then say, you know, good luck. Um, we're here to help you run it, help you process your data, help you get the most out of that. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what that slide's about. And then um, just real quick before I uh, go to a, a demo, um, I just wanted to point out we're actually having a Boreal workshop in uh, Fort Collins on September 30th, um, which is the day after the uh, Colorado State uh, Energy Symposium. Um, it used to be called the Natural Gas Symposium. I believe it's called the Energy Transition Symposium now. And if you're interested in, in learning more about how to optimize your Boreal, um, I've got Magali's email address there. Uh, I've got her phone number there. Uh, we don't have all the details yet, but we'll be uh, letting you folks know about that. And so um, any other comments on the presentation, John, or I'll go to the, uh, the demo. I'm, uh, I'm good if anybody else has uh, more comments. I'm available via email. Ultimately, though, what we're discussing here is not only how you can get more valuable leverage of some very expensive assets, but what the best way to do this is and how this has been demonstrated in real um, world market position with this. So the laser is just a tool. It's the best tool for laser-based leak detection, but then the best tool to multiplex, in other words, bring together High definition camera, forward looking infrared laser, for example, uh, is the Red Hen platform. And uh, we're uh, very pleased to be working with Red Hen. We've got a couple of decades' experience uh, with that. Thank you. So, here what I have in front of all of you is a, a, um, a quick demonstration of uh, I've got the Red Hen proprietary software, which is Isware, pulled up. And here I have a video that I've opened in Isware, and then I've opened up Google Earth. Um, Isware has a Google Earth plugin, and then um, and then we can also uh, convert your your videos and information over into a, a format that will work in ArcMap for uh, Esri users. So in this particular video, I have the subtitle option employed and so what that's doing is this is the information that the VMS embedded into the video as we took this video um, and here you've got latitude longitude um, you know altitude isn't a big deal here um, how fast are we going um, and then um, and then here we've got our ppm level which is you know basically the most important data because in this particular survey, we're just using a color video camera and the Boreal. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start this video here using the, the video player. And as you can see, um, I'm moving right along the track log here. 
So I want to get to the uh, to the important stuff down here, which are these red points here. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And then what I can do is I can pick any point on the map. And I can just, uh, I've got my PPM levels. And I want to just start the video here. So I'm just going to hit play video. And then as you can see, I'm skipping to the important part. And uh, here I see I've got my elevated methane levels. And just looking at the video, I can, I can get a pretty good idea of where this uh, methane is coming from. <laughs> because, of course, we're driving through a dairy. And, and as you can see, we've got a truck here and uh, the cattle are eating. So, so I can see you know, where my methane is coming from. I can see my, my PPM levels on my video are, are getting elevated. I was, uh, looks like I was up to, uh, let me start over here. Looks like I, I had uh, made it from uh, 1.4. It looks like I was up above 5. There I'm at 2.8 now, from 1.4 to 2.8. There I'm at 4, 4, 3, 5, 5, 1. So I've got, I've got 6.2. So I've got my emissions, but let's just say uh, I don't want to keep replaying this video. I just want to look at what they are. So I'm just going to go right to this point here. And, um, you know, I've got my 5.2 right there. And so what, what we, one of the things we do here at Red Hen is we help you analyze your data. And we, uh, this, this type of reporting, this is something that we can, you know, put together for any of our customers who are doing these surveys. And here I've got a 7.6 level, so I can see what it was there. I've got an 8.2 level right there. Um, and then I can just come down to the track log, because I see I've got a pointed level. I want to know where, where is this location on my pipeline. Well, I've got a QR code right here, and I can just snap a, a picture of that QR code, text it to my uh, maintenance person, or uh, my repairman, and they've got these coordinates where they can go out and locate exactly where that emission is coming from and do whatever repairs are necessary. And so this is just basically, this is your finished product once you've, uh, once you've done the survey. Um, this is the kind of information that we get for you. So. Again, here's a yellow point. I'm at 4.5 there, <clears throat> so that's an area of concern. I'm, you know, it's not a not a red line, but it's getting pretty close. Um, and so that's basically, uh, you know, how this uh, how the system works and and what you get uh, coming out of it. So, if anyone has any questions, uh, please go ahead and type those in. I don't, I haven't seen any come up. Um, John, do you have anything to add? No, this, well, what I do have to add is this is a great way to illustrate how the Red Hat application pulls all the discrete um, data inputs of the feeds together to give a more creaturist deliverable to an end user. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's logical, and you can dig into the metadata wherever you want. So end clients love deliverables like this as opposed to uh, large reports. Sounds great. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. Uh, if you folks have any questions, I'll uh, pull up our contact information for you again here real quick. Uh, so you've got, uh, you have, oops. So you have here, uh, you have uh, John's email at uh, Boreal. Um, you have Bog's email here at Red Hen. Bog is one of our technical uh, engineers, and um, he's the he's the man that you see uh, flying in this helicopter right here. So he's a good guy to ask those technical type questions to. And then uh, you have my information. And if you are a helicopter operator and you want to get into doing pipeline work, you want to go make a sales presentation, uh, feel free to email me. I will do my best to help you out with that. John will do his best to help you out with that. And then if you're interested in more information about our workshop, uh, we've got uh, Magali's uh, information there.
And it looks like I do have a question here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask that question. It's from Claudio. We, we appreciate the question. It is, uh, what is the recommended distance uh, to be from the source? I'm guessing, I'm guessing what Claudio is saying is, what's the recommended height uh, that you want to fly that helicopter off the ground um, to optimize uh, the detection of emissions? And Claudio, my answer is I like to fly about 150 feet, uh, 100 to 150 feet um, to try to capture those plumes. Uh, of course, uh, the wind uh, speed is going to affect, you know, how high you want to fly. And, um, and then uh, the next, the follow-up question to that is what about ground surveys? Um, you know, how close do you want to be uh, to the source on ground surveys? And I'm going to hand that question over to John. Well, with a ground survey, you do your very best to follow the pipeline itself. Um, what you can try and do with pipeline surveys is, if there's any wind, and there typically is, have a small offset to the downwind side because gas leaks. Um, especially if the ground is there's a lot of play or it's uh, it's cold. Um, gas leaks can travel along cracks. So ground-based surveys inherently have challenges associated with them, and it's counterintuitive, uh, meaning you think, well, air surveys are further from the pipeline, but um, there's more of a commingled plume and a greater likelihood of hitting it. So what we say, if you're doing ground surveys, offset a little bit on the downwind side of the pipe, and um, you're either walking it or driving it and, and doing uh, the best you can. Now, Ground-based grid surveys are a different approach. Uh, grid surveys would be monitoring, say, a landfill or uh, an area source, such as uh, you know an area that's uh, got a fractured geology and you're looking for seeps. Then um, uh, the wind becomes a non-issue, and uh, a simple grid survey will give you a hotspot configuration. Yeah, I think uh, I think John made a great point. Um, you know, whatever direction the wind is blowing, um, you know, you want to be on uh, on that downwind side of that of that pipeline to uh, you know to optimize your findings. Um, my my uh, my idea for best practice is, you know, if the wind's going to be over 20 miles an hour, I mean, it's just not a good day for a survey, in, in my opinion. Um, what do you think about that, John? Well, it, the feedback I've had from pilots is that if winds are either really gusty, which is a challenge, or greater than 15 knots, they don't do the aerial surveys because the gas is scattered in all directions and it's, it's challenging. If you have uh, wind that's consistent from one direction and less than 15 knots, then pi pilots, they've got experience and they'll fly in a vector um, to that pipeline that compensates for the wind. So they just fly downwind a little bit more and consistently find those leaks. So rule of thumb, if it's gusty or greater than 15 knots, don't do it. Um, if it's less than 15 knots and um, consistent wind from one direction, then you're okay. You just need to fly in that vector downwind from the pipe uh, to accommodate for the drift of the plume. Okay, um, we got a couple more questions. Uh, thanks for that follow-up, John. Uh, what is the probability of driving under a plume or totally missing it? And again, that's from uh, Claudio. Um, and Claudio, my my opinion on that is, um, you know, when when we're talking distribution lines and a bumper-mounted setup uh, to try to catch uh, emissions from distribution lines, your chance of driving under a plume is is very slim. Um, when you're talking about driving out in the country and driving around, you know, tank farms where you've got uh, tank batteries where the emissions could start at a higher point, and you're looking for methane, which is a very light gas, uh, you do in that case have a better chance of driving under uh, the plume and missing it. However, um, with the sensitivity of the boreal. Um, I, I don't think that's very likely. Uh, John, what's your uh, opinion on that? 
May I, I, I can elaborate on that. A number of years ago, uh, one of our clients did an independent study at the Rocky Mountain Oil Field Testing Center in Wyoming. And they created uh, a number of artificial leaks down to very, very small leaks. And the Boreal system was compared against a number of uh, aerial leak detection techniques. And the Boreal system uh, performed the best and found over 90% of those leaks in a variety of conditions. I forwarded that particular study to Brian, and he'll be happy to circulate that to you if you wish. Yeah, that's a good point, John. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. The reason, you know, Red Hen, we can use any any sensor with our equipment. Our reason for choosing Boreal is because Boreal is the standard, and the reason Boreal is the standard is any of any uh, government testing that we have done, um, and and John can tell you about you know other other sensor testing where, you know, government agencies. Uh, you know, other folks, they'll test these sensors. And the, the, the way that new sensors are tested is they're tested against the Boreal. And so, you know, in this particular illustration here, uh, Bog has uh, the Boreal hooked up, and then he also has a couple of other sensors uh, hooked up on this UTV. And uh, the reason for that is they're testing these other sensors to see if they're as good as uh, the Boreal. And so, you know, with the Boreal being the standard, it's going to pick up more, more uh, emissions. It's going to be more sensitive to the methane in the air. And a, a great point that John made is it's going to work in all conditions. Um, one of the complaints that Boggan and I have gotten from uh, our prospective clients is that there are other systems out there that do not work as well when it rains. Um, and that is because of the reflective nature of the sensor and the scatter system that the sensor uses. With the Boreal, you don't have those issues. Um, you can use it when the ground's wet or dry. You can use it when the temperature is hot or cold. And uh, it's going to be the, the most sensitive and the best sensor out there. Um, but um, yeah, you can't ever get 100% uh, perfection, but it is the best thing on the market. Um, so on to the next question. <clears throat> Robert says, what is the ballpark cost of the equipment? Um, Robert, what we'll do is uh, John and I will go ahead and, and follow up with you uh, after the webinar to get you some uh, pricing information, figure out what, what uh, package you want to look at, and uh, go from there. Um, does the Boreal uh, send a beam at 180 degrees? Um, like a peacock's tail. Um, I the short answer is no, but I'm going to let John answer that question. So again, John, the question is, um, does the boreal send a beam at 180 degrees? Um, and then parentheses like a picture of a peacock's tail. Well, I, I think what you may be um, the, the individual asking the question. There are a number of different ways that airborne um, leak detection or gas monitoring can be accomplished. And the, there's, um, there are three systems that are in existence today that use um, a high energy, either atmospheric backscatter or ground reflection system, uh, Synodon and Lazen and Pergam. Um, Synodon and Lazen. Uh, Synodon is an atmospheric backscatter system. That technology was originally developed by NASA. Uh, our equipment was actually used uh, to validate the performance of the Synodon system. Uh, they're a Canadian company. Uh, originally, I mentioned that technology was from NASA. It's a service. Lazen is a service as well. It's a ground-based um, backscatter. I can't comment on how well the atmospheric backscatter works, but the ground-based backscatter, the uh, challenges they face is that the helicopter has to be perpendicular, and, and, and the system looking down has to be perpendicular enough to the ground to get enough backscatter. So there are two challenges here. If the helicopter banks, um, some way has to exist for that laser to still hit the ground, and if the ground is at an angle, or there are a lot of scattering effects, um, you may lose signal. 
I don't know how many challenges the Lazen system encounters with this. I know that the PERDAP ALMA system uh, encounters lots of challenges with it because every time you bank, uh, the laser, unless you have a way to gimbal that and accommodate for that, uh, doesn't necessarily bounce back to the receiving point. So the Boreal system is self-contained as opposed to a laser hitting the ground and coming back. Um, methodologically, there are characteristics, so there are um, advantages and disadvantages with each approach on paper. Uh, practically speaking, when you shoot a system from up in the air, say uh, 150 feet, you've got to subtract all that methane outside of the plume and you've got to get the reading back to the laser. It's quite challenging. The Boreal system is a self-contained probe that flies through the plume so you never lose signal and it doesn't matter if the ground is wet or cold or if the train is undulating or if you're banking the helicopter, um, we'll still see that, that plume. Yeah, if I can add a little bit on <clears throat> to a couple of these questions you guys asked, um, one was about the under the plume and missing missing the, the concentration. This is uh, Bog, by the way. Folks. Yeah, sorry for jumping in. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, so far from what we've seen, you never really want to be under the plume, but, you know, you, and it's kind of impractical to be under the plume, at least from what I've seen. Um, you know, you, you really want to be at least at the level of the stack. Um, I mean, obviously, there are certain other corner cases, like what if the, for instance, infrastructure is buried, uh, but then you still have the escape points, so you're still going to be either on top of those points or have a pretty good understanding of where they are. Um, in terms of 180 degrees question, um, it, it's kind of interesting because a lot of the people and customers that we talk to are trying to, you know, they've tried the LASIN, they've tried the DOM, they've tried all those companies, and what they discover is uh, there's certain complications like John was mentioning. You really have to fly essentially orthogonal to your infrastructure, and you have to maintain that positioning with respect to the pipeline or the infrastructure you're flying to. Uh, and you really can't uh, do much in terms of, you don't really have much wiggle room in terms of maneuvering. Uh, so a lot of the infrastructure that we fly, uh, it's in the middle of essentially nowhere, where you have nothing but a right of way and in some cases, the right-of-ways are not really well-maintained. So you have trees and power lines and things like that to deal with. And for you to, uh, you know, maneuver around those or in, in certain cases, um, you know, pick up elevation when you need to, uh, you really run into these kind of issues with, you know, your scatter system where you just get garbage. Um, and there's a lot of also problems with re re reflectivity of the signal. Uh, and a lot of companies uh, have to maintain and c conduct these patrols on a, you know, quarterly basis. So in your fall time or in the springtime where things sort of start melting and you get lots and lots of moisture in your right away, you also hit the problem of, you know, getting nothing but garbage. Um, and, yeah. and in a lot of cases, uh, that's what drives our customers to, uh, to try us, and, you know, Red Hand System is a service company and that uses Burrell because these kind of problems sort of fall, you know, they just fall apart, they don't happen. Uh, and obviously, um, for what we've seen as well, some customers are just not happy with the fact that, um, you know, the companies like Last and Sudan, they just fly, right? So they get it right away, they take off from the airport, they get to the right away, so all the customer gets is this continuous um, recording, and there is no sort of idea where you enter the right of way, when you get out of the right of way, when you enter into the right of way. So they also don't want to waste, you know, let's say three or four hours of just watching the video, where all they can do is just focus on specific spots that they're interested in, and that's what we provide. We provide that flexibility of pinpointing the proper location that will uh, help the customer out. Uh, also, um, you know, if you ever 
dealt with sort of conducting these top-down surveys, you know, that, you know, your right-of-way bends, it changes angles, and mid-flight you have updates for that. Uh, and sort of common uh, technique in sort of flying these is conducted these like things called clover loops. Uh, so you hit like a bank and you're right away and you conduct this sort of loop and then you have to get back into the right away. So those also uh, kind of mess up um, the process of data acquisition. And uh, in the case of um, Borel, you essentially minimize those loops and essentially save money in terms of your flight time. Uh, so it's now the advantage that I discovered with the you know helicopter pilots. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. Excellent. May, may I add um, an observation and, a, and an interesting comment? People have asked us, well, is it possible uh, to miss the plume? Is it possible to fly under the plume? Is it possible that the wind gusts would diffuse the plume? and we'd miss it? The answer is yes. Now, does that happen frequently? Is this the best technology? In many cases it is, but the important thing, the important thing to look at is if you choose to go into visual inspections, pipeline leak inspections, right-of-way inspections, there are sweet spots that different technologies shine in. Uh, we had one client who started out with a very expensive and a very good FLIR camera. And he discovered that during the summer, his camera did a beautiful job of seeing pipeline leaks. In the winter, it didn't work as well. And he ultimately added a Boreal system onto that. And ultimately, he multiplexed that information with, um, with Red Hand and a, and a high-definition video camera. So now we had a FLIR camera, a high-def camera, and a Boreal system. So the advantage Red Hen brings to the table is they can leverage all technologies, and they can do it blindly, meaning um, it doesn't matter if the Boreal is working in a sweet spot, it's, it's a good day, the wind's not gusty, we see the plume, or the same thing with a FLIR camera. They bring different technologies together to maximize um, the likelihood of detecting events and dealing with them. And there are different circumstances where one technolo technology will perform better than others, but Red Hat will take them all and pull them together. So you've got all those tools at your disposal. Cool. Well, um, I think I'm going to wrap it up uh, for today. We appreciate uh, everyone attending. And um, again, I'll just pull up this slide here if, uh, if you have any uh, questions. Uh, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we will uh, post this uh, this presentation as well. And uh, we thank you all for your time. And uh, have a great day. Bye. Thanks very much.